to apparently. And so there you go. That's what I get to do. Um, I actually do answer a lot of questions around fiber in the state in terms of legality of what you are and are not allowed to do. And so if there's questions around that, we can talk about that. I'm going to start by introducing our panelists and then I'm going to talk about this bill and then I'm going to let them talk. Terry Yates, the town of Cary infrastructure manager and network manager. And network manager. Yep. Jeff Wilson, town of Holly Springs, CIO. Rodney Roberts, network engineer, city of Greensboro. Do you have a new title? Network services manager. That now. Um, Dale Waters is the CIO for the city of Salisbury. Do you have a title associated with Fiber as well? Uh, data center manager. Data center manager, okay. And then Adam Oates from Jacksonville. Network manager. Network manager. Okay, so all these are networking people for some variation. I don't know. I know Jeff does a lot of fiber splicing, which is super weird. Him and Rick have built a pimped out paper van. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that, it's a panel van, it's a creeper van, and it's pimped out. And actually, it's really, really cool. So you should probably share pictures of that on the Nickel Jesus listserv because it's pretty awesome. They've, they have like a, y'all cut a hole in the side of it, like, so you can do things. It's really interesting for creepers. Um, <laughs> we will laugh in this session, if nothing else. That's my goal. Okay, so this bill is House Bill 68. Has anybody heard of this bill? One person? Two people? Okay, three people because I talked about it. Thank you. I'm so glad you listened in class. I think there are other people sitting in that class and clearly did not listen. Okay, and so, Daniel. So, this is House Bill 68. It's also called the Bright Futures Act. It is in a various um, and a sundry number of forms at this point. The current form, and there is also something being done by the County Commissioners Association that's a separate bill is literally to allow cities and counties the authority to lease excess capacity on their networks to the private sector. Currently, counties do not have that authority at all. I understand there are counties doing it. Craven County is doing it. Unless somebody fights you, knock yourselves out, right? That's not good legal advice. Brandon probably have a fit right now. But if your attorney tells you it's okay, go for it. Right, Brandon? Sure. They, they just made you <laughs> um, But this one actually, there's a lot of language that's been inserted and finally taken out. It used to say things like unserved areas, which would be nowhere in the state of North Carolina under the federal definition. It is now just in general, if you have excess capacity, you cannot build a network specifically for the purpose of leasing, but you are allowed to lease excess capacity. It has not been passed yet. It has been referred to the Committee on Rules and Standards or something like that. I did hear last week that the representative who is pushing this, he's from um, Cumberland County, Representative Soka, is looking for somebody in the Senate to carry it through on the Senate side. There's nothing in here that gives me pause. It also gives you, I think, what is probably more interesting, other than the specific authority to lease, which some people are doing, um, it also gives you a 25-year option for said leases. That's a big deal. Currently in North Carolina, property disposal law, please help me, Brandon, is 10 years. If it's a lease longer than 10 years, it is considered a sale of property, of real property, and you have to follow a different set of procedures. There's creative ways to get around that. I will also tell you that the I, okay, so let me stop for a second. Y'all know the term IRU? Does everybody in this room know that term? IRU? Does anybody not know that term? Okay, good. I thought it was just me. This is something that they all talk about all the time. Indefensible right, right of use. It don't mean nothing under North Carolina general statutes. It does not change the name of the game. It is still a lease. So Jeff has a 20 year IRU, which is a 20 year lease for that property. Do you guys have IRUs, Brandon? No. No, okay, so he's got a 20 year lease. His attorney decided to do that, said it was fine. Okay. Right. Actually, I think you guys might have followed this specific we did the RFP. Yeah, you, even if you do an RFP, you still, I believe, have the same limitation on property disposal. It depends on how you style the right. Yeah, I think John probably did it in a unique way. And Jeff can also send you a copy of it. It's pretty standard IRU, but what they did was they considered it excess capacity or surplus equipment, surplus lines. 
and then put out an RFP to see who would use it and how they would use it, and then gave it to Ting, Ting which was, were they the lowest cost, or the best offer, or whatever is best offer. And so that's what they did in Holly Springs, but I'll let Jeff talk about that. If you're interested in this bill and you want to see a copy of it, let me know. You can come to me afterwards and read it, or I can send the link to you if you'll just drop me your business card. I'll sit and do it during the business lunch. Yes. It is House Bill 68 <coughs> of the Bright Futures Act. You can also go to ncleg.net and just search for Bright Futures. Bright is all capitalized. House Bill 68. If you want this bill to get passed, I would rarely tell you to contact your delegation, but I do think that this one is one of the few that I've seen. At least this version of it is pretty positive for local governments in North Carolina compared to when they had unserved written in there. Or they also had language in there that said if you had received any Connect America funds, any of your private sector providers had received Connect America funds, AT&T largely, that you could not build out because they had gotten authority to connect four households in your community, literally, Northampton County, four households. Um, so they've taken all of that out. I imagine you will see a pushback from the telecom industry, but it also specifically disallows, well, doesn't disallow, it specifically states that you are not allowed to just go into the broadband business, fiber to the home business, which I've got at least one person talking about that, right? That's fiber. Um, you know, I've got people from Wilson in here who could talk about it as well, although I felt like we make poor Wilson talk entirely too much over the years. Um, you still have to follow the same level playing field act, as they like to call it, which is House Bill 129 from 2011, um, in order to get into the broadband business. Basically, it's almost impossible to get into the broadband business, so trying to do that is going to be difficult. This allows you to leverage the capacity you already have and build and allow the private sector to pay you, which is good, for access, and then they can go out and build out the last mile, which is what Team did. Okay. We have had, uh, let's see, you guys are leasing, are you leasing yet, Rodney? So they're leasing, Craven County is leasing, anybody else here leasing fiber assets to the private sector to build out to last mile? <coughs> Those are the three communities I knew of distinctly already doing it. None of them have been challenged in court yet. Right, Brandon? <coughs> challenges. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to start and we're going to work our way through. Does anybody have questions on that before I go further? No. Okay, good. I'm going to start with Terry. So what Terry's doing in um, the town of Cary, they actually are one of the only places in the state that I've seen doing intelligent transportation systems. They built fiber, oh, wait, like 15, 16 years ago? Yeah, 2001, we installed our fiber. So he can talk about that, and he's going to talk about what they're doing, and he can talk about the parking sensors you're getting ready to put in as well. Okay, okay. Do that. all right. Sprinkle some parts and stuff. In. There you go. <laughs> So as Shannon was said, um, we, uh, we installed our fiber plant in 2001 through the DOT grant. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear the House bill. Uh, there's always been some argument within the town about you know, what we can do and not do with our fiber. <coughs> um, we have roughly 150 miles uh, in our fiber plant, um, which connects over 30 facilities, um, different types of technologies we use at carry. And then uh, we also have 200 traffic intersections. We just got through putting high def cameras at about every intersection. Um, having having that fiber and uh, a com conversion over to IP, uh, we have small switches at every single intersection, which uh, is starting to allow us. There, there's talk of us doing some pilots with autonomous vehicles, um, self-driving cars, of, of, you know, letting the lights control uh, you know, how they operate, um, and then so. I work together, our technology service department, our public works department, and our traffic department works all together on our fiber installation. So anytime we build a new facility, we all get together and all determine, you know, where we can we connect, how can we connect. Um, <clears throat> we're always looking for partnerships. We recently connected up with Wake County uh, for our public safety radio system. Um, so we have interconnection with Wake County. We're, we're talking with Apex. We're trying to figure out what what the use case is like with Holly Springs to see if we can connect all of our fiber together. Actually, I think the whole county, we're trying to work on the county project. Um, and uh, as far as fiber to the home, uh, 
we through, in, through the NC Engine project, uh, we we got uh, Google and AT and T to start installing fiber at home. Um, it's not riding on our fiber. We've had discussions. I think I mean we're all for it. Our other departments are a little hesitant about uh, leasing out our fiber. Um, they're just concerned about how we would handle maintenance issues and, and getting into that into boxes and all of that. I know some agencies have figured that out, but there's a lot of concern around that. Um, and then as far as the parking pilot, we're actually installing sensors today. Uh, we created a, what's called an Innovation Experience Center on our town hall campus. And what we're going to do there is because we have our fiber plant uh, really robust on our campus, and we have networking equipment robust on our campus, we want to do small pilots with smart cities because uh, there's a lot of buzz out there and a lot of things seem like they work, a lot of things seem like they don't work. Um, so we're going to do some small testing on our campus uh, with existing vendors, new vendors, using our fiber. Um, and they're installing uh, parking sensors in front of our community center and we're going to create an app off that. So staff can see how much, park, how much the parking space is being used. Citizens can see, hey, a parking space is available. Um, and that's just kind of one of the technologies. We're going to be testing autonomous cars on campus as well. Um, so those are some of the technologies we're using. Awesome. All right, Jeff has got probably one of maybe the more robust projects in terms of a leasing agreement. So they built out a fiber network everywhere, what, maybe four years ago, five years ago? Six? Three. Three. Okay, three years ago. And they actually did that RFP process that I was talking about briefly. And so what they did was they found a partner to lease that excess capacity. You did not build it for that purpose, right? Correct. You built it. So there's a very clear distinction. Let me be clear about this. I don't care if that law gets passed or not. You have to build it for your own governmental purposes, and if you put in excess capacity, then you can lease it, right? So you don't just build it for the idea that you're going to generate a lot of revenue, because it's not going to generate a lot of revenue, and it will generate a lot of headache and splicing of fiber and need for creeper vans, potentially. All right, so Jeff, you can talk about that? So Jeff Wilson, that he directed Holly Springs about four years ago. We um, decided that we needed to control some of our broadband, or our connectivity costs between facilities. Um, did a business case, a full, one thing I learned from the city of Wilson and here Will Acoff talked for years about it, was that the business case is your reputation. So even for the local system that was not meant for leasing or, or anything at the time, that we still did a business case to make sure it made sense and that we were, weren't going to be getting ourselves in a hole. So we did that, it worked perfectly for that, I got funding for it. Um, we actually did a 10 year loan on ours, um, 1.5 million, I think, to start the network, and I think at the time we built 13 miles out. Um, so we did that, and that was actually a cost, the payback on that was a cost recovery model where instead of paying for um, services from a provider, it just paid for the debt service for those 10 years. Um, we have well exceeded our ROI of 10 years that we had planned just because of what else we've done with the system. Um, I recently figured out if we literally cut all of our fiber off but told any provider that we wanted um, the exact same redundancy and the exact same speed to our facilities that it would be over a million dollars a year in service. So it's actually kind of crazy when you start thinking about that. Um, the council would never approve a million dollars a year. but. So since then, we put that in. Um, we've expanded it every time we like, get a new facility. It's required as part of the construction budget to get fiber to it. Um, another thing we're doing right now is trying to connect all of our state of pump stations together um, instead of and having the radio as a backup system and fiber is primary. Um, build, excess, build your excess capacity to every pump station because it passes by a lot of places. <laughs> um, and the other thing, too, is had an introduction with Ting of multiple years, a couple years ago when Google Fiber um, wasn't looking at Holly Springs as one of the options. So we had a lot of pressure from our residents on fiber at the home services. CenturyLink had a tiny bit and AT&T probably had about 10% of the community. Everything else was the CenturyLink services in Time Warner. Um, we got an introduction to Ting by our consultant because they had just done a project with them in Westminster. And it kind of really hit it off right off the bat and Ting just love the community. Um, so when we started looking at the option of leasing versus um, 
leasing to them or them building it, we ended up deciding to do the RFP process to um, put in the specifications. You know, we had to start building within six months of the fiber of the home network and you know stuff like that. So the requirements to be able to start leasing it to do the 20 years of considering excess capacity. Um, the one thing I will caution anybody on leasing, it is not the biggest money maker that you ever think it's going to be. It's not going to, leasing is not going to pay your network off. You need to have your internal numbers first to justify it um, or have some really good economic development to kind of feel good qualitative numbers to tie into it. So, um, with things on it, it lit up the first couple neighborhoods. They built out multiple neighborhoods now and we just have, haven't connected them with our fiber yet. Um, to those because they're not ready to start doing the install, it's just the house would be built. But it is true, they do the last mile. We have our routes were designed to go by um, all the main, so we can double pretty much all the DOT roads and everything else the thing has to deal with is just inside neighborhoods, which is local encroachments and permitting processes. So. All right, so Rodney is, um, I think, Rodney Hall, he's Partially modeling after the tri gig effort. No, you're tri gig. No, we were tri gig. <coughs> NC Engine. I don't, they're trying to get it. I think they, they all are very similar. But that, you guys were actually talking about this when you were in class. Well before NC Engine or TriGig or any of that existed, Rodney's been thinking about this for a really long time, trying to figure out how to do it. And I think a couple of years ago, they came to us with a, two sets of private sector partners. One was a nonprofit, and the other was actually a, a provider that was trying to figure out how to do this. I'm going to make an editorial comment and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Be careful of the private sector provider who comes to you with these kinds of ideas because what they, they were going to hose the city in my opinion with his model. Y'all would have lost a lot of revenue opportunity because of the way he was wanting to build it out. He essentially wanted the government to fund his investment in the infrastructure. Is that fair? Yes. Um, and so be careful about that. <laughs> Is the only thing I would say, but now they've got a really cool model, and I'll talk about that. Well, I guess our story is a, a combination of, of both the stories that you heard uh, so far. So about ten years ago, with uh, the, some DOT grant, we built out about 150, well, it's not so small, about 100 miles of, of fiber to all of our, our facilities and 300 plus traffic signals. Um, we had the foresight to add a little over a million dollars of, of IT money to that project, uh, that NCBLT project, so that gave us the ability to use that fiber as we saw fit from talking to our legal department. Um, we got a really, also a really great relationship with our transportation group, so we don't, we don't install fiber. Transportation doesn't install fiber, but they do all of the troubleshooting and, and uh, the, the, some of the last mile stuff. Uh, so, so that got us to our, got us our, our, our fiber. So, I guess, like you said, it's about two years ago we, we talked to, to Shannon after uh, hearing what would happen uh, with, with you guys and wanted to do a regional initiative. So. With Greensboro, Guilford County, Berlin, City of Burlington, uh, High Point, we all got together and formed, you know, what we're calling the flash name, Trigate, to go out and um, the main goal was to not to make it more difficult for the <coughs> service providers to just do the Charlotte Raleigh thing. That happens a lot. A lot of people from Charlotte and people from Raleigh, but they would kind of skip over like the Greensboro's and the Lentines and the, the, the places that are not quite that, that size. It's exactly what happened in the engine. So they did everything and then they can hopped over Greensboro's to get there, uh, uh, Winston-Salem, but that was more of an educational type thing. So we got over that. <laughs> you don't say you sound a little salty. No, I'm, I'm salty. just saying. It's my turn, man. It was your shit. <laughs> so, uh, I wasn't with the tab when it's the engine on sign up. Some little reason. Seriously. Yeah. So we've got, so we put out an RFP. We got a, a few res our responses. Some were not, we didn't take serious because of, you know, their, their business 
model that we, we've actually decided on, we have decided on working with the North State. We've got a, it's a really cool story of being a, a local uh, ISP that's got all of High Point covered. So High Point's been a gig city for years, but they've never advertised it. So in working with North State, North State's actually started becoming the Greensboro. We are a little early on, we're just working on some pilot sites, we're trying to figure out um, all of the little gotchas on some pilot sites without being uh, too, uh, too grandiose. We're looking at, uh, I guess a couple of them are more for the, the areas that the ISPs don't want to cover. An ISP will go, in, go into a, a, a area based on the amount of return that they get for their investment. Their, their business, that's what they, they need to do, but they pass by those neighborhoods that they don't see a, a business case for. So that's one of the major uh, drivers of uh, uh, TriGig is to make it cost effective to still hit those neighborhoods. So a few of our, our pilot projects are specifically tailored around those uh, those areas. So we've got a couple pilot projects with that. And being in the, 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 the spider industry, we're working with all our, our regional partners. The really, the biggest benefit to me right now is the relationships that were formed during that, during that whole RFP process. Since that time, we've uh, had a lot of conversations with, uh, with um, High point and everyone to out of our own money, totally separate from Tri-Gig, the land and dark fiber to connect our cities with some potential for like a centralized data center, some some back, some you know pie in the sky stuff right now. But I mean, that's kind of where we are right now. No, we do. I did say earlier that we we lease fiber. We are leasing to uh, our one of our local universities. They had a, a long span of probably, I don't know, I wanna, let's, let's say it was four miles uh, from their central campus to, I think, an agricultural campus or something. And believe it or not, they were still running like dollar time. Is that A&T? No, this is uh, 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 UNCG. Oh, UNCG, okay. Yeah, they've got a, um, they've got a uh, remote site. They were running dollar type services, but it was just kind of too expensive for them to do anything else. We went right past it. So we went into the, the, uh, the leasing model, and like everybody said before me, leasing isn't to make money, it's just to have something something uh, documented. I can't quote the, the price, but it's, I mean, it's almost like one of those $1 per year type things, just to say it's on the book. So with that, there's another really good relationship that was found, and Smart cities. Smart cities is kind of a touchy study, but uh, I guess that's where we are right now. So, uh, one comment on that. One of the challenges that we have in this state is the way we measure broadband or connectivity. And so, when I go out, I, because I do the broadband evaluation for the state um, through the Golden Lady project, and what we see is that MCNC, which I love, and I think they're a fantastic resource, but they provide connectivity to every school district not to every school, right? And so there's a vast difference if you're, I mean, even in parts of, I mean, maybe not Holly Springs, but parts of Raleigh, like Wake County, there are certain schools that really don't have super high safety <coughs> capacity. And I know in rural North Carolina, there's lots of that. So the district office usually has an awesome pipe, and then the other schools might not have that, so that's another opportunity. From what I can tell, and maybe I'm wrong, Brandon is, a, is an attorney and then probably can speak to this better than I can, there's nothing in House Bill 129, which is the Level Playing Field Act, that would prevent a government from intergovernmental connections for governmental purposes, and schools would be considered governmental entities. So that's the good news, and this bill does not eliminate that. They did have a version that eliminated that and we yelled at them. So correct me if I'm wrong, but cities and counties can e can do e rate to schools, correct? Cities and counties can do e rate to school and I think Adam's gonna talk about that. Are you we we tried. We, we tried we, we tried to do it. Um, 
with Onslow County Schools, and we we actually applied for um, a long leaf pine grant. Oh, gold leaf, gold leaf, yeah. There you go. There. And um, <clears throat> it fell through, so talks at that point stopped okay. with with the with the school system. But we were working on getting E rate. Uh, we were very close to it, and and they they pulled out a little bit. So there but has, there's still some talk with them. But there's been a change in what E rate funds, right? They don't fund overbuilds. I, I don't know if they even fund fiber connect. Do they still fund fiber they connect? Too? We, we got denied. Craven County got funded. Craven County got funded. Craven County got funded for E rate. We we got denied because we're just there to be denied, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So Craven County serves as a spend, which is a service, what that means is they have a service provider ID number, basically, and they have that, so they are an E-rate provider, right? Um, it is, it's an application process, but it's not horrific to do, but apparently they do look at who the incumbents are, how many you have. Okay, Dale is, um, and so many of you who have been to our conferences have heard about Wilson and Wilson's Greenlight Project. I don't know how many of you know about the Fiber Project in Salisbury. <laughs> Dale came into this. How long have you been there? Uh, going on eight years. Really? Yeah. God, because of that. Okay, so he's been there going on eight years and got promoted into the CIO role um, and is in the middle of the exciting non-stop political rigmarole involving <laughs> vibrant if you are following the news for any reason in Salisbury it is a political hot potato vastly different than the Wilson experience I think in terms of people in Wilson were really happy residents in Salisbury are really happy they just happen to have a unique set of board members who may be less happy so he's going to talk about Fibrant and from a from a city perspective and how you're using it connectivity wise, but also from a last mile service provider. So he's the only one doing last mile service. Right. So I want to touch back real quick on the E rate stuff because we also applied for the E rate for Rowan County. Oh, interesting. Uh, we didn't tonight? we didn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, they applied for they wanted fiber to every location, and we uh, <clears throat> we replied to the RFP. With fiber to every location, we were somewhat competitive for what they were asking for, but another incumbent came in and just blew us away. But I don't think they gave them fiber to every location. I think it was kind of like a cable mode in every location. So it was the lowest bid, but the, the way that it was written was terrible. It was. And the federal government, for e rate purposes, tape requires you to go with lowest response and responsible bid. <clears throat> Right. So the way that it was written was, you know, you could do anything. They basically just want connectivity to all the schools. So uh, they said they wanted fiber, but then the way they wrote it, it was anybody could do anything, and the lowest better one of taking it. But maybe in 10 years when it's up for renewal, we'll try again. Uh, anyway, City of Salisbury. So City of Salisbury has always been very fiber rich. Uh, we started off, I don't know how many years ago, way before my time. Uh, have a bunch of multi-mode fiber in the ground to a bunch of locations. Some of the outlaying locations we had wireless links to. Some of the other locations we had Time Warner VPNs. Um, once the, uh, they decided to go with the fiber project, I think discussions on that started somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago, and they decided to go ahead and move forward with it. Uh, started building out the plant about 10-ish years ago, and we pass about 16,000 homes uh, and businesses. So we've got fiber in our entire city, all the way out to the city limits. So if your neighbor's not in the city limits, we can't serve them because of the, the regulation, but we can serve any home or business within the city limits. Um, once we put that in the ground, we did fact, build it out with excess capacity. So all, a lot of those multi-mode links that we had for city facilities, we changed over to the single mode fiber fiber. And we're actually, I don't know if I should be saying this or not. <laughs> we're among uh, friends. We'll, yes, we'll delete yes. the recording. So uh, <coughs> fiber is actually leasing fiber to the city. So it's kind of an interesting situation. Uh, we are leasing some fiber to some of our customers 
but I think we can do that because of our uh, kind of grandfathered into the before the rule type of type of thing. Um, but yeah, we've got high speed internet, high speed uh, you know we've got telephone services, video services, so we're direct, in direct competition with AT and T and Time Warner and I guess Spectrum now. Um, but. <coughs> We've got 10 gig interconnectivity between a lot of our facilities. We've got some of our businesses in town actually have 10 gig service that they take from us. Um, not a not a whole lot else to say. I'm sure you guys have some questions, so I'll uh, be happy to answer any of those after we're done. All right. So now, Adam, can you talk about what you guys are doing in Jacksonville? Because you are leasing fiber to the county. Okay. So we're we're actually fairly new to the game too. Probably about five, maybe six years ago, we partnered with DOT and put in fiber whenever they were running it throughout the county to not only in the city but throughout the county up to you know stoplights that kind of stuff. Um, our gotcha there was um, whenever DOT put in the fiber, um, we asked for a specific amount of strands to each location. And they brought that specific um, uh, number back to a to a main pipe, but that main pipe only had that number on there too. So at a, at a at an intersection, we would have you know 12 strands, 12 strands, 12 strands come back to a pipe with 12 strands. So we we had to go in after the fact and put in more fiber down our main strands. Um, and in that, we partnered with Alto County um, government, and we. Um, offer fiber to them to uh, multiple locations and we just share the cost of um, maintenance so basically they they pay maintenance to us we put it back in a fund and once that fund reaches a certain amount then we take money out of it and build more fiber um, so that we don't incur cost um, you know past so we're making money to, to put in more infrastructure um, and, and that, that's what we're doing. We still have a kind of a hybrid solution where we've been leasing dark fiber from um, Time Warner, which is now Spectrum, um, for a number of years to a number of our locations. And we've continued that lease because it's, it's, it's a pretty good deal at this point. And we haven't built out as far as a lot of the, the panelists here have. So. Do you have plans to do that to build it out further? We do. Um, so we're 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 strategically placing um, the fiber in places where we can start building that last mile to all our facilities. Um, and, and we we work with our transit department. We and we have a and um, the city of Wilson. Um, but we are in our transit department. We actually have guys that can install, splice, and do everything for our fiber. So we're we're able to do everything in house now. And you have a creeper van. Well, it's a, it's a it's a creeper trailer. So we, oh, they went up to you. What makes it worse? Eric's the one that made mine officially. Have to see our creeper trailer has an Xbox in it. Oh, Rick, where are you at, boy? But you're going to try to win one. They do want to put a big TV in the trailer. <laughs> you should win one at the conference and then put it in the creeper van and the creeper trailer. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious to me. I don't know. I, I was like, I just quick side note. I have seen every data center, I feel like, in the state of North Carolina. I've looked at all of y'all's beautiful fiber um, or cabling where you have it in racks and you show me your cabling. And by the way, they're all beautiful and sexy and I love them. Um, but when Jeff was so proud of his creeper van and it made me go out in the parking lot and show me the creeper van, I literally was like, I don't think I've ever had the experience of having to ooh and ah over a creeper van. Like, just, I mean, it's beautiful, for it sure. It has emergency response purposes. I'm sure it does. It's got wires on it. And it's yeah, it's actually, it's really cool. I, I was just teasing. Um, just, just to break the ice a little bit. Okay, questions for the group before I start asking questions. They would much rather have questions. Yes, sir? I have one question in regards to possible kind of interlocal group for providing fiber. 
it, it does get to a point where you're able to provide positive public schools. I know that um, a lot of times through our general assembly, they're now requiring like a percentage of whatever public schools getting funding um, goes to charter schools, because that's kind of pushing them down. I'm wondering if the charter schools would also be able to, you know, ask for that same ask. So the charter schools would lease fiber from the governmental entity? Right. Would they be considered a governmental entity or? Brandon, do you know how charter schools, they fall under the same laws in terms of public records law. I know that because there was a court case about it. Um, my gut tells me it, you probably would be able to. I'd have to research that a little more. But because certain standards do apply, like the public records law, I can't imagine why you would have to consider them a private sector entity that you're leasing to when they clearly have statutory reasons to be considered a public entity. If you stop at an MCNC booth, talk to Joel over there, he understands what the charter. Yeah, charter school. Okay. We were talking a little bit about when Holly Springs was coming in and they were um, I don't remember what he was saying, but the process to get an activity to them since they're MCNC eligible. Oh, if they're MCNC eligible, then I would think that they are eligible for you guys as well. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes. Um, so we have five we're going to all our facilities and we do that as we build them, but we're starting to look at going to intersection cameras and that sort of thing. Um, how difficult is it working with DOT or do they have a pretty standard procedure? Because that's not something we really have. Yeah, we, we just put our, we put our own stuff uh, on cameras in. We didn't really clear anything with the DOT. Uh, I mean, they just helped with the, with the funding of the initial network. But then we're pretty much maintaining the network after that and we can add any kind of cameras. We, we used to have uh, analog cameras running with fiber uh, but we've recently, uh, because we now have uh, switches at every intersection, we convert those over to IP cameras at a much reduced cost. Uh, and if, if, you want, if anybody wants any information about it, they can send me an email and I can provide what kind of cameras you're putting in. Do you have to put in your own poles and all the cameras? Yes. Yeah. 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 DOT is <coughs> unique in that they don't have standard that is something that the state, um, is particularly the broadband office, which is not called that anymore, but just Searle, that is something that they have been working on, trying to get DOT to these standards, because depending on who you talk to at DOT, you hear yes or no, and there are no standards, from what I can tell. Rodney, you guys negotiate with DOT, or no? So I've gotten there. I mean, we're actually literally working on it right now. Brandon, I know, has. Yeah, I think that's one thing to keep in mind with DOT, like Shannon said. By the way, Brandon's from the city of Raleigh. He's the attorney. He's the only attorney that ever comes to our conference, so everybody should buy him a drink tonight. <laughs> 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 yeah, but he's... Don't get legal advice if he's been drinking. Totally get legal advice if he's been drinking. It's way more fun. Okay. Go ahead, Brandon. What we've seen is you'll have different districts in DOT will have different agreements, some of which will contemplate through a municipal agreement if you're doing a shared project with them, how you can use the fiber. I know with the NC Engine project, we had very different terms in Raleigh as part of our traffic signal build out than Chapel Hill had, for instance, because of the different district offices. Another thing to keep in mind also is if you're stringing on to utility poles, your, your agreements with Duke or Duke Progress may limit what you can do with your fiber. And that was also something we had with the NC Engine project. The Duke Energy communities had very different terms to be on Duke poles than the former CPNL progress and the Duke progress jurisdictions had. And you ran into that with Duke, right? We did. Um, we have two entities. We have a local co-op. They were very easy to work with. And then Duke, there was a lot of make ready that we had to do to get poles ready. Um, including some replacements that we had to replace their poles. So, um, but I mean, DOT wasn't hard to work with, you know, uh, you just, the way they build networks and the way we build networks was a lot different. They daisy chain everything where we don't, and that's where, that was the biggest hiccup for us. So we're right now literally, yesterday just kicked off our project for um, traffic light signalization of fiber, and DOT, had to go to um, the Attorney General's office to get approval on it. I think they had to make a legislative change last year because we're the first municipality who was offering DOT fiber and they didn't know how to handle that. We didn't, we didn't go on top of DOT fiber 
And You're leasing so, fiber to them. Yeah, we're going to give it to them. We're giving it to them. Um, okay. Because it helps us out. But we literally just started it, and they're actually been really helpful because they don't have the staff right now to do the traffic management. Right now, we have radio reads. We have radios. We have some lights that aren't controlled. They have to send somebody out from, I think, a Durham office or something like that to come work on our signals that they're flashing. Um, so they actually have a, one of their products right now. They, they want municipalities to start taking over signals. Um, control of carries been doing for years. I think Raleigh does their own signal controls. We do that. And so, and, and they're looking at Apex and Fuqua to also do the same thing. And um, they've been really great to work with simply because they don't have to spend, they're not spending any money on this project. We're giving them fiber to pass by most signals already. Um, they're just using our, our engineering department. Actually, Kendra kicked it off yesterday with it and um, we hope to have this project done by August. Like he said, the biggest thing, DOT daily changed everything, so it's a big change. Um, we're trying to get them to do GPON, let us do GPON and all their stuff, because that's what we utilize a lot in the field, which is the, the, the passive optical network where you can take one fiber and split it up to 32 times, 32 ways. Um, we use Kalis equipment for that. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle is changing their mind on the technology side of it. So, But otherwise, they've been really open and really easy to work with because um, DOT gets administrative funding, cuts a lot in budgets, and so the less that they have to worry about, the better. So they've been, they've gotten easier, a lot easier to work with. And I'll say also that uh, the DOT has a connection into our into our fiber network, so they can view all the cameras. So they're all they're happy to for us to put up cameras so that they can access. Yeah, they've been encouraging us during the design to make sure that we have prepared it for cameras on the intersections, but they want them and they want and our PDs and want those people look at them. So in Greensboro we got uh, we got a Greensboro DOT, so we kinda of have a middle uh, lane through and they manage all their all their cameras, the transportation manage all their all their cameras and it's just like you said before that state DOT has <coughs> views into into all the proceedings cameras. So they're, they're great with them, so they've been really good to work with. Other than one, I'll give them one little, little dig. And what I've seen in traffic fiber, if there's something down, it can run, it can run isolated for days or weeks, so it's not an emergency. But on IP network, if it's down for, you know, any time, it's, it's an emergency, so I would, be careful if you're going to actually use NC DOTs fiber <coughs> for the, the main tag. Anything that we, we actually pulled, uh, uh, maybe it was a, a, a few miles of our own fiber parallel to NC DOT fiber because we just couldn't, we just can't afford services to do that. Phil, you were lashed to DOT fiber? We are lashed to DOT fiber. And you're last to DOT fiber. And what is that doing to you guys from uh, working with them? Anything? Uh, well, the city of Salisbury is under contract to maintain DOT fiber. Okay. So they pay us to maintain our fiber, so it's not a big deal at all right now. Uh, in the coming days, it may become an issue. Right. So. <coughs> There's a debate about fiber and whether they're going to lease it to a private provider to manage the service of last mile and triple play. We have no idea where it's going, by the way. Um, yeah, Brandon just shook his head and squinted his eyes. And we should talk, because I've been on the phone with about 85 attorneys, and they're driving me crazy. And of course, in classic standards, they don't talk to y'all or Dale about it. They call me, and I don't know what they're talking about. Um, I have a question. Oh, wait, wait. anybody else have questions? Brandon. A question for Holly Springs. In your agreements with Ting, how do you apportion maintenance responsibility? That was my question. question. We actually, so we do all the maintenance and we bill them a per mile um, amount each year. Same thing as NCNC does with our fiber. We just use their numbers. So we maintain it all so that there's no other, nobody, we, we do all the actual splicing into our network too. So if they give us a handoff, we do the splicing with our splicing closures and they get billed the roll cost for, for doing that. And your contract is a publicly available document, yep. yes? Yep. I know I've sent it to the attorneys in Salisbury for them to take a look I'm at I'm sure it. you know our attorney, John, to be on Holly Springs. If you so. want it, Brendan, I have it. Okay. It's more fun to call John. 
Or you can call John. You can have a good conversation with John. Yeah, he's hilarious. Um, other questions around Fiverr? Because that was my question and I'm devastated that I can't ask it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm with uh, uh, Coast, Carolina, uh, Coast Carolina Community College in Jackson. Yeah. Right now we have all our fiber coming in through MCNC. Yep. We we are quite a few times that goes he down. said we could change that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's one of the things I want to ask about. Does this house bill allow us now to sit there and get into the city park? Well, I don't know why you couldn't do that currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can do that. You can because do it now. Now we only have one feed coming in, and we love being able to get other, but we've been told that for the law that we couldn't sit there again and say, could be said. Well, this. I don't think the. I don't, who told you that? Uh, I'll what have to look at my records as far as what we had back in Coastal, but that we had to stick with MCNC and could not have a secondary income. I'm wondering if for you guys that are doing Does anybody do community stuff, colleges? Do you do Rowan Affairs? No, we're trying to get into it. We do the private colleges. See, they're doing private colleges and they're trying to get to Rowan Affairs. <coughs> anybody else here at community college? Nobody. I don't know that that's accurate. Okay. I, I don't know why you would read the law that way. Brandon, can you think of any reason? I think it would could be based on whether or not you're a county specific community college. I know Wake Tech essentially operates in the same manner as county departments in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so we would view them as an extension of the county. And if you're a multi-county campus, I don't know if that would somehow get you treated differently. But it also could be an MCNC regulation. I think that might be why we're not in our community college because it's you're not really just in, right, it's not just So in. that does present an interesting question that I had a discussion with ECC recently. And they were asking, they called to ask if I've got, let's say, I'm going to pick on Greensboro. I don't think it was involved in you guys. I don't remember. Um, but it might have been. So it was, let's say, Greensboro and Burlington. And they're trying to get the two of them connected. Is this, is this a real piece? Oh, okay, good. So it was you. And so they're trying to get the two of them connected. Their question was, can we go through the county that is not either city and who owns the fiber because you're not authorized to really go outside it for last mile purposes you're not really you can't go outside your own city limits I and mean, then we learned that very clearly when the SEC yeah. ruling got returned and so there's like this big debate about whether you can do that under the current general statutes of 129 it's fine if you're connecting for a public purpose, right? The cities need to exchange data, but I cannot think of a reason the cities would need to exchange data when they're in two separate counties. Unless you could argue for a centralized data center or disaster recovery, which was my recommendation. Um, think creatively from an IT perspective, not. I don't, I don't know if Salisbury is special. Well, I know Salisbury is special. <laughs> That's a different kind of question. Uh, we can go outside the city limits for economic development. Now, yes. I'm not sure if we can go outside the county limits for economic development. You, not for last mile though. Can you do fiber to the home? Well, we can do fiber to the business. Oh, interesting. That's probably in 129. It's a specific exemption for you because Pine Tops is not being served in. Wilson County specifically because they're not authorized to go outside the city limits of Wilson of the city of Wilson, right? So I know that that, that was a whole FCC ruling that got overturned blah blah blah. blah. Um, okay, interesting. Just so you guys know, there was one other bill I wanted to mention that I didn't think I needed to mention, but now I think I do, and it's around wireless siting. Wireless communication siting. I know Brandon probably knows more about this than I do, but it's House Bill 310. It starts to change the game for it's written around small cell wireless or micro wireless. I don't even know what those terms mean. I know they're really small antennas that they put on all of your stuff to basically allow them more capabilities to service. And there is some very specific language in here, such which is kind of similar because you who was it said that you paid. Salisbury pays fiber for the service. That would be a requirement. If any city <coughs> enterprise accessed the rights of way, you would have to pay the same service charges that the private sector would have to pay under this. And so there's some interesting changes in this space 
that you should probably be paying attention to. I know the League of Municipalities and County Commissioners have been working diligently to get this law written in a way that is much more, it is driven 100% by the telecommunications industry. And when I say 100%, I mean like 110%. And so they are trying to fix some of the things that are in it. Um, it also uh, tells you that you cannot have any exclusivity contracts, and I worry about that because I worry about if they try to extend this in any way, shape, or form, or if you're partnering with somebody and they're using wireless as a way to serve last mile, they probably fall under this with no exclusive contracts, which you know, Ting is an exclusive contract. Well, no, I, mean, I can say we still have excess fiber. Anybody, so anybody I mean, can Google fiber, so we will, we will never sign an exclusive yeah, contract. Yeah, well, you can't. You can't, you can't engage in non-discriminatory non-discrimin yeah. uh, practices, yeah. right? So you'll have to keep, but you also have a limited capacity, just like your water towers. If, you're, if you allow people to lease space on your water towers, there's only so many people that can get up there First come, first serve. Right, and so it's kind of this first come, first serve model. It's still open to everybody. So in, that, in that bill, some of the carriers are trying to get off those water tanks. They're trying to pay in the lease fees. Yep. They're trying to get on the poles. Oh, oh carrie's going to die. Because how much money do you make a year? A million dollars a year. A million dollars a year in fees that they charge cell companies for a co-location. Yes. yes. Yeah, by the way, everybody should look at the way they negotiate their leases for their water towers and things because I think y'all probably make more money than anybody else that I can think of. How much do you know how much y'all make? I think we're about forty five thousand a site now. So yeah, it's still pretty decent change. And then some of y'all are out there getting full access for free email accounts. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. We made we made we made thirty six thousand per carrier per site. So the water tank has four carriers. And you're at 45? I think our latest ones are 45. 45? Boy, you better up your rates. Carries more high brow than Raleigh. It's a, it's a, it's a never-ending thing because you have the, your standard agreement, and so you, we reevaluate every 10 years. Right. So that's when we all start talking to, to the surrounding and then we set our prices at that point. But, but that bill is very concerning because they want to get off those sites. Some of the carriers want to get off those sites. Some of the carriers are kind of... And, and what's interesting to me, uh, because we, we provide, you know, uh, support for public safety systems, these small cell companies will come in and say, oh, this is going to be great because you need better emergency response and, and, you know, having all these small cells is going to provide blanket coverage and all that. And I go back to them and say, what about ice storms? What about snowstorms when the power goes out for two days and you have no generator on those sites? Because those sites are going to die. These high sites, they, we, we let them roll in generators. I know some sites have generators currently installed. But when those sites go down, your police cars in D.C. stop working. People cannot use their cell phones. We've seen it over and over and over again. So I always get back to them. And I also get back to them on how they're going to maintain if a car hits that pole and the, and, the, and the cell site goes down, when are you guys coming out to fix it? You have to get a DOT permit again to go put a new pole in, which can take two. That's right. So, it, yeah, those are things we've been asking as part of that, that bill. So. Terry looks like he's 12, but he's been in this business longer than half of y'all have probably been alive. That's what I was telling him earlier. And I mean, he knows he's more about it. Than <laughs> Seriously. He can start his own four consulting years, four years, four years, He's got four years till retirement, so y'all will probably see him as a consultant at some point. But before he retires, if you run into any questions on that, he is always my number one go-to for everything involving cell towers, attachment fees, any of that stuff. He knows it inside and out and has done a bang up job at um, the town of Cary delivering some of the coolest work that we've seen. So talk to Terry for any of those issues. And he's really willing to share, which is awesome. All right, any last minute questions? Because I'm trying to get y'all, yes. You talked about the cell providers. Have they come to you yet and wanted to borrow some of your fiber to reduce the strain on their towers? Uh, they have not. Uh, most they of them. They haven't built it. Really, they, yeah, they, they, they really haven't. Their, their, all their towers? I mean, they, want, they, they basically just lease for whoever, or don't put their AT&T fiber in. They really haven't talked to us. I mean, we've been talking to Google and AT&T about, you know, about the, uh, leasing our fiber, but again, it goes back to public works and traffic are a little hesitant. Uh, so you say borrow. Do you mean lease? I mean, yeah, lease. They want, okay. They, I was they like, you shouldn't let nobody borrow for free. Well, yeah. no, we're not borrowing. Yeah. Oh, okay. But they, they actually <laughs> they've oversaturated, especially Verizon uh -huh. in Guilford County. And 
they can't carry anymore. So have you negotiated a lease? They're working on it. They want to put in, and I don't know if it's these mini it's towers, but they're stuff. actually <coughs> going to start converting people to void. Yeah. Because they just can't, can't carry the signals on their towers anymore. I mean, it's starting. You yeah. could actually see it in the Verizon service. Yeah, right. Jeff? And before we go, we're going to talk about the Wake County. Please, go for it. Can I, can I oh, wait a minute. He's got one more question, and then we'll let Jeff talk. This is just one more question for Terry. In regards to how that revenue comes in, does that revenue actually go towards the IT department? Hey! No! <laughs> 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 Sorry. No fun. All, all of that funding goes to the general fund. Um, departments have tried to, Parks and Rec has looked at, oh, well, we, we can negotiate a carrier, we can get the funding, we build a ballpark with lights and stuff. I don't know, the problem with that is, like, it goes back to, we're all the same team, you know, all the departments are on the same team, and if you let every department do do that, I mean, it's just going to be, I mean, fire department, you're going to have, you lose that standardization. You know, they, these people want to charge this, and these people want to charge that. And IT will be supporting them all for nothing. Right. We'll be supporting it, and it, it'll just be a pain in the butt. I mean, I, I really like the model we have. I know departments would rather do their own, you know, but I, I like the model we have. If it were me, I'd put it into, like, an innovation fund or something like that. I would, I would, or at least a percentage of it, I would earmark it, not for IT, but for innovation, right? And the people from departments could try to, you know, Come up with cool ideas to do something. Yeah, yeah. And actually, one thing similar. Sorry, just just one. And if you are looking at this, or you make sure you build capacity in for yourself, because we've had several instances where, like our wire speed reading system, where we were we had to reinforce the tower or a tower or tank, whatever, to get our antenna on there. So make sure you get at least twenty percent. Put your stuff up first. Yeah. One thing I can say, like they put their water stuff in there. One thing I can mention is fibers. Like we're Jackson, like Jacksonville, we have an enterprise fund for all the fiber operations. Everything is 100% separated. It rolls into, it rolls into reserves for repair work. It doesn't get tied up in the general fund. Um, that's part of the LGC getting us getting approval to get a loan on this network <clears throat> because we weren't allowed to use any any expected revenue to pay back the LGC loan. I mean, pay back the loan to the bank. Um, so it makes it where it's not co-mingled. They know that the general fund is paying for the loan because it's cost recovery based off of not buying services. And then everything else, all revenue, all maintenance fees, even if we build a new facility, the cost of the fiber construction gets transferred into that account as revenue. It's almost like paying the town to build our own fiber something. And but that is different than what they did in Salisbury, right, Neil? You guys had a general obligation bond. Right. So that's the difference. They had a general obligation bond, and that's where the whole battle has come from in Salisbury, is that the money is so commingled. And Wilson did the same thing, actually. And so the money's commingled, so people will say, it's losing money, it's not paying itself back, they're borrowing from the water and sewer fund to supplant the, you know, whatever it is. Actually, that's the argument I hear in Wilson, is they're taking the money from the electricity's fund and pulling it in. Um, to hide losses or whatever. I'm not saying that that's accurate. I'm just saying those are the kind of arguments you hear. So separating it is a really good model. So one other thing that we've done too is we've worked with our engineering department. And as soon as they see plans come in that somebody's boring, mm -hmm. we automatically go to the company and say, hey, we, we want to put a condo in right with yours. So we have a conduit all over the city that eventually we will attach. But usually we can get it at a really, really great. Price. And that was a model that Seattle used in the 1980s. They had it written into their city ordinance that if you opened a ditch, yep. the city got to drop conduit in yep. and fiber if it wanted to. There's actually, if you look at the case, that's CTC um, technology, like the company that we use for all of our CTC, and CTC mm -hmm. they did a, a big case for San Francisco. They worked on a huge project, and it's about the the joint trenching. Um, our engineering department is very open to it. They always tell us every time that they're doing anything. Um, and one of the things that we're even looking at requiring, since we want to get all of our SCADA stations, is requiring that when somebody has to build a pump station for any reason, that they have to build conduit from that pump station out to the main state road so that we can tie into it at that point in the subdivision. Um, so there's all different kinds of ways to get the conduit in, because the construction is the expensive part. Yeah. Buying your uh, plus, uh, corning fiber is the incremental expense. Right. <laughs> all right.
Did you have something else you want yeah. to say quickly? So one of the things to look at too is the regionalization of the stuff. There's been a big project. Um, Wake County led it recently. It used to be led by Raleigh when Gail Roper was there, but um, uh, Bill agrees that Wake County's taken it on, and then the Triangle J Council of Governments has also um, kind of taken it on. It's the regionalization of fiber mapping. So like Terry, Terry stuff's in there, all the municipalities in the Triangle J, but it's not just for Triangle J. Does anybody who wants to contact Wake County and say, hey, let's, we want to put our, our stuff in there. What it does is allows us to get some redundancy. Um, like right now, Apex and us actually built to each other mm -hmm. because we're, going, we're giving them access on our fiber at MCNC. We're doing redundant data centers for some load balancing of, um, and also we're switching from Wake County Sheriff's Office's RMS system, the OSSI system over to Wake to Apex's system because our, our agencies have a lot more commonalities um, and then we're going to do a lot of data redundancy. So there's a lot of stuff that we're working on, at least in the Triangle region, and it's not just for the Triangle region. And always make sure too that if you're working on the fiber step, reach out to anybody else working on it because most everybody else has been through the pain of construction. Um, we in Jackson, Jacksonville and us probably, in Castle Hill are probably the largest users of the city of Wilson's construction crews for work. Um, and so and they've got the expertise that's just incredible. So, um, and Goldsmere has also done some really interesting work. Yeah. Is Scott sitting in here? He's yeah. just like, yeah. okay, he just emailed me and I checked it. And he's, he's done some really interesting work <clears throat> with the third party um, to share fiber with a communications company to get, you got four strands in areas that were unserved, that's right. right? That was better. So, yeah, with clarity. So there's some interesting people like Craven County, Goldsboro, which is Scott back in the back, gray hair, <laughs> beard. Any of these gentlemen sitting up here. Um, Wilson is a go-to. I know you work with Wilson. I know you work. Did you work with Wilson? Me? Yeah. yeah we work with Wilson. You work with Wilson. Um, so there's a lot of people in this space that know a lot, a lot more than I'll ever care to know. If you can't remember anybody's name, you can email me, and I will tell you who to talk to because it won't be me. <coughs> But I can talk about the paper band. <laughs> and never, never let your, never let an engineering firm also be your contractor. We had that. We first initially did yeah. the project with mapping and using the construction company, and we knew right away that it was built for what would be the easiest for them, um, and also what would give them the most money. So we went with an engineering firm, designed it, and then RFP'd it out, and we got exactly what we needed at the lower, of course, lower cost because. Right. Construction companies who also did engineering are going to tell you that this is the easiest way to go. It's easiest for them. They still will charge you the same amount per foot on the way it's more difficult for them. But you know, it's, they can get more more progress in by going a different direction. So, so. We are out of time. I know you had a question. Uh, I was just going to ask for your contact information. Mine? Yes. Oh, it's um. My last name is Tufts, not spelled incorrectly like in the program. <laughs> I mean, I've only been doing this job for almost 18 years. It is T as in Tom, U as in Uncle, F as in Frank, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, at unc.edu. I don't know that it's wrong in the program. I'm just it was wrong on the thing you signed in and received that. They called me Tufts as in T-U-F-F. -F. Which I am, but um, so yes. And if you want any of their contact information, feel free to walk up. Lunch is being served in the main room. So go there and have lunch and you'll hear me talk again in a little while about this. Thank you guys. Thank you.